joining us this evening. Um, we're still kind of coming out of this pandemic, so I, I appreciate even more than in, in uh, previous times, the opportunity to connect with Guardians community. The virtual doesn't in any way replace the in-person and, and all of the, um, the benefits of in-person gatherings, but it can create a real sense of belonging and community. So I'm thankful uh, for all of you who are joining us for helping to create the Guardians community. In these Wild Earth webinars, we, we try to bring together national issue experts, people from frontline communities, elected officials, and even Wild Earth Guardian staff to talk about a critical issue at a critical time. Our purpose, as always, is to inform, inspire, and activate guardians like you to help us really create the kind of world that we want. Uh, and sometimes that means confronting powerful industries, demanding greater leadership from our elected officials, whatever that entails, your spirit and engagement really makes a difference. And so know that we do these for you. Um, a part of that means that we like audience participation. So halfway through, I'll take a question or two and we like to finish with a final five or 10 minutes of questions as well. So you can log your questions in the chat box and I'll try to get to, to as many of them as I can. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about uh, the 30 by 30 campaign uh, and its bold vision to protect um, both the biodiversity that um, inspires us and to respond to the climate crisis as well. With me today to discuss these matters are um, Zachary Wurzbach, who's the Corridors and Crossings Program Director for the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. Um, he is joining us from Bozeman, Montana. Also joining me is Ethan Link. He's an integrative evolutionary biological diversity uh, specialist, um, and he's interested in understanding issues related to climate and landscape structure and biological diversity from gene to genus. He lives here in Santa Fe. He's a postdoctoral research fellow at UNM, University of New Mexico. And also joining me is Madeline Carey, who directs Wild Earth Guardians campaign to protect the greater Gila bioregion and also our campaign uh, to push for voluntary grazing permit retirement on public lands. Welcome to all three of you. It's good to have you. So um, I thought we'd jump right in. Um, we've, got, we've got an hour, it'll go by quickly, uh, especially with three of you. Um, just to get to, um, to, get to the, the issues. So in late January, President Biden, um, put 30 by 30 on the national policy map when he issued an executive order that among many other things directed the Interior Department to develop a plan for achieving this bold vision of protecting 30% of our country's land and waters by 2030. I'd like to hear from both Ethan and Zach to start this. How, how did a policy like this come to be both from the scientific perspective, and then let's dig into it from how it developed in the policy and political arenas. So Ethan, why don't you start? Yeah, um, thanks so much for having me, John, and looking forward to chatting tonight. Um, so I think it will probably surprise no one on this webinar call that um, 30 by 30 has its roots in issues that the conservation community has cared about for a really long time. Um, and, and and particularly has its roots in the field of, of conservation biology, which is of course a, a really mission-driven science. It's kind of a, a crisis discipline that is interested in, in preserving biodiversity across all sorts of different scales and, and making sure we have representation of the different ecosystems um, that we all depend on for ecosystem services uh, and, and all the issues that I think everyone um, who supports Wild Earth Guardians 
cares about. Um, and, and conservation biology is, of course, a really vibrant and, and complicated discipline. Um, and, and I don't want to undersell that, but I would say that, um, that, that probably most conservation biologists would agree that when it comes down to it, the best way to sort of reach the, the goals of conservation biology in this mission-driven science um, is to set aside land um, that has a, a bare minimum of human influence. So basically, if we protect more land, we're going to be able to make sure that species don't go extinct. We're going to be able to protect ecosystem services. Um, we're going to have a more habitable planet. Um, so then the question sort of shifted to, we know this is the best way to reach our goals. How much land, how much fresh water, how many, like how much of how much of the oceans do we actually need to set aside in order to, to reach these goals? Um, and this is this has been a, a question of debate for, for several decades now. Um, and, and most studies sort of fall out somewhere between 25% of the Earth's surface to 75% of the Earth's surface in some form of conservation management. Um, more recently, uh, a number of advocates, most uh, probably most prominently E.O. Wilson, have, have started kind of picking numbers out of that range um, as, as kind of a rallying point. Like, you know, we, we think and deal with probabilities as scientists, but it's, it's not so useful when we're, we're trying to reach particular targets in, in, in the advocacy world or, or in the sphere of politics. Um, and so E.O. Wilson um, in, in 2016 wrote a book basically proposing we set half of the planet aside for conservation. Um, and to the, to the best of my knowledge, a, a year or two later, um, the, the first real uh, proposal for 30% for by 2030 um, was, was put forward by Jonathan Bailey and um, Yaping Zhang. Jonathan Bailey's uh, with National Geographic. Yaping Zhang is at the um, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, and in an editorial for the journal Science, they, they basically said 30% of, of, of land and water is a, a significant step forward from what were known as the IT targets, um, which were from sort of a, a previous UN conference on, on biodiversity that suggested setting 17% of land aside, 10% of ocean and coastal habitats aside, um, wi widely considered wildly insufficient. Um, and so, so Bailey and Zhang were basically like, the, the half earth idea is good. We need kind of a, a feasible intermediary. 30% um, by 2030 is, is a good start. Right now, I think, you know, some back of the envelope math puts us at about 14.6% of the, the earth's surface is protected um, or terrestrial environments are protected, maybe 3.6% uh, of ocean systems are protected. Um, and, and so that op-ed kind of, I think, got the ball rolling. Um, but it was really, I think, made concrete by a, a paper in Science Advances by Eric Dinerstein and, and a whole list of co-authors, many really prominent um, conservation biologists and ecologists who, who sort of took this, this suggestion, this catchphrase, and, and, and made it tangible in terms of how are we towards reaching that in, in different terrestrial ecosystems? What is it actually going to take? What are the benefits? And, and they kind of broadly treated this as, um, as under, under their, the, the acronym they, they put forward in the paper is GDN or a global deal for nature. Um, and you know, I, I, I know Zach is gonna talk, talk policy with us in a second, but. I sort of consider that the, the start of 30 by 30 in, in, in a scientific sense. That's the scaffold. And from there, it, you know, it's taken on a life of its own. Thank you. I love, I love the term scaffold because now we enter the new arena having climbed your, the scaffold that you set for us of how does such a bold scientific concept with climate and biological par imperatives gain traction in political and policy arenas to you, Zach. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's really happened just as, as Ethan has described with uh, kind of this linkage of 
this key papers, this key framing with the international policy structure of the UN's Convention on Biological Diversity. And I think there is one kind of key thing. So, you know, this originally it was this target of 17% conserved by 2020, you know, and as a result of this scientific work and other papers, E.O. Wilson, in beginning, I think 2019 or 2018, all the big international environmental NGOs said we've got to do 2030, we got to do 30% by 2030. That should be the new goal in CBD. Um, and I think in, importantly, there's also really kind of a vague policy directive that's been associated with that. And the key thing is that they say um, conserving this land can be done through protected areas or other area, other effective area-based conservation mechanisms or OECMs. And one, I think, critical kind of consideration from this is there's still a lot of debate about what an OECM actually is. What is an effective conservation measure that would contribute to a global target? Um, you know, so anyway, so while this is happening at the international level, you know, beginning end of 2018, 2019, um, we start seeing really strategic and really organized communications and advocacy group, uh, largely spearheaded and funded by the Weiss Foundation, uh, really start to take shape. And it's been, I mean, it, as far as kind of organizing and, and communication strategies, it's been extremely well executed. Um, and so what you started seeing was you kind of started seeing a lot of think pieces and key opinion pieces. Um, you saw a lot of key groups like Center for American Priorities, Center for Western Priorities, really grabbing this and running with it. Uh, and it's been supremely effective and really uh, kind of organizing the conservation community uh, around tangible demands for the administration. So while this is going on, and actually you see now a lot of these kind of key folks who were in organizations like Center for American Priorities, they're now in the, in the top policy of CC Ops and Interior. Um, and so that's kind of a direct linkage is, is going from this extremely well organized communications and advocacy campaign. Um, people who are really leading that are now in leading policy positions in the White House. Um, and that's really kind of where we get to this executive order. Cool. I think what you're saying is elections matter a lot. Elections matter. Yeah. <laughs> well, well that, do. it's great. I appreciate having this context, kind of the basic context. I read, I don't read a whole lot of scientific papers, but in the last few days, I read the, that Dinnerstein paper, the Global Deal for Nature. And my next question really was spawned by having read that, which is, um, you know, it was surprising when I first read the executive order, and this is an executive order from like, I think January 27th that Biden issued, and uh, that 30 by 30 was included in an executive order that is all about using the government's entire resources to address the climate crisis. And once you understand this, you see that it's not a coincidence that 30 by 30 is included in this executive order all about addressing the climate crisis. Could, could you each speak to how inextricably linked climate and biodiversity protection goals are in the scientific and the policy rationale for 30 by 30? And, you know, try and just, I know you could go for, like, try and be brief in explaining that rationale. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you made that connection. Um, I think, you know, when when I think about 30 by 30, I, what, what strikes me is kind of the rhetorical brilliance of it is how it mirrors sort of the the, the sloganeering and, and the language that the climate movement has adopted, and particularly these this idea of this this 1.5 degrees Celsius target that we want to keep global warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and what, what's so interesting about the the Dinerstein paper is is how while I, you know, I think I'm a, I'm a biodiversity scientist. I think a lot of us here are, you know, obviously really concerned with climate change, but but come from sort of a background where we're interested in preserving species and ecosystems. Um, and, and as are a lot of the the co-authors on this paper, um, they they really lead into it by talking about how land conservation is essential to keep us under this 1.5 degrees Celsius target. And, and particularly, they cite um, the, the Paris Agreement and, and, and work by um, the Conference of Parties, where, where basically they lay out the fact that in order to meet this target, 
as, as much as a lot of the attention is focused on, you know, like greening our grid and, and, um, and carbon removal and all these other things, we really need a rapid reduction in land conversion leading to a, a complete all out moratorium by 2035. And this is particularly true in ecosystems that have, you know, a, a super high potential for carbon sequestration, like tropical forests and, and peatlands. Um, but, it, but it really uh, affects all of us, including us in, in, in temperate North America. Um, and, and so by sort of, by, by framing this, um, this global deal for nature and, and the 30 by 30 targets, um, as as part and parcel of this this broader climate agenda, I think they really set the stage for the Biden administration um, and, and and sort of the, the political apparatus in the country, which was you know starting to heat up and mobilize uh, in a, a more earnest way towards towards addressing these climate goals to to take to take this issue issue which could have been framed as really niche, like this is. This is biodiversity conservation. It's it's not about people. It's it's you know uh, it's nice to have, but we've got this big pressing problem we should tackle first. And say, hey, these are inextricably linked. The science says they are, and in fact, it will be a lot easier for us if we can actually set land aside than if we're relying on a magical technological solution or asking people to sacrifice even more than we're gonna be asking communities and industries to sacrifice as we transition to a, a post-carbon economy. So I, I think it's super important, super interesting way they framed it. Um, and yeah, I don't think it's a coincidence that that's why we have this executive order now. Yeah, anything to add briefly, Zach? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that. I think it is a really good and strategic framing uh, because in the policy sphere is these things aren't always inextricably linked. And it is really important to, to recognize there are a lot of tensions if you're considering just the mitigation angle, right? By switching to renewable energy, which have an awfully large land footprint if you're talking about solar developments or wind farms, these things can also impact biodiversity. Um, I think really the framing around it where it's saying these land-based and conservation uh, strategies are effective for both mitigating by reducing land-based carbon but also for increasing resilience, right? And for serving as climate-based solutions and helping uh, communities and other folks adapt. Um, so I think that's, that's, a, that's a really notable. Yeah. Madeline, you wanna get in on the conversation? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I'm just grateful to be here listening to my smart friends speak so eloquently about this. And I think, you know, from it on, an on the ground perspective, on why it matters to have sort of a federal vision marrying these two issues is, um, you know, for a lot of folks, climate action exists in this totally separate space from any sort of wildlife conservation. And for a lot of wildlife species, a lot of species we care about and that people care about, the existential threat of climate change is one of the biggest threats to their survival and that's coupled with land use. And so nesting 30 by 30 in this broader climate action really starts the dialogue that it's right. It's not just about getting a species listed on the Endangered Species Act to protect it. There's a whole suite of ha climate driven habitat impacts and habitat impacts from land use that we need to be looking at. And, you know, for my work with permit retirement and the wolf is sort of a perfect example, you know, until we really deal with the land use impacts and, and those impacts on biodiversity, we're not going to protect the species. Thank you, Maddie, and uh, thank you all three of you for, for setting the table. I'd like to get, move the conversation along and get to, okay, where do we go from here? Kind of how, do, how, does, how does the Biden administration and how does the conservation and climate advocates achieve the vision? So Zach, I'm wondering if you could again, briefly just say, fill in the audience, what are the basic next steps in implementing uh, Biden's executive order? Uh, just on the 30 by 30 piece. There's a ton in there. Yeah, well, I mean, frankly, I think, you know, there's supposed to be a report coming out in the next week. I would be surprised if there's a lot of substantive action there at this stage. Uh, and I was kind of frankly surprised there was going to be such a quick turnaround, mostly just because political appointees are just getting into place. Uh, the folks in acting positions who are kind of usually, you know, career civil servants aren't going to get out over their skis on really outlining uh, something super ambitious. I think the next step right now is 
agencies are really going to say, look, there's a lot of different mechanisms we can use. Here's what they might be. Um, there's probably going to be an interagency uh, steering committees to start hammering out what exactly does conserved mean um, and really kind of narrowing in on that. That may also be done through rulemaking. Again, I'm not, I, I couldn't really say at this point. Um, there's probably, you know, once that happens, there's probably going to be, and there's already some discussions, I believe, with USGS uh, thinking about, okay, how would we figure out, you know, what qualifies as conserved and meeting this target? Um, you know, so, and that might involve kind of creating a new kind of categories in, you know, the USGS's protected area database um, and kind of thinking about uh, basically figuring out what would qualify. Those are kind of the the kind of low hanging fruit in terms of next steps. Um, but I think for like really achieving the, this kind of substantive large collaborative vision, there's gonna to have to be a lot more pieces in place. And I think it's hard to say exactly what those are gonna look like yet. Um, I would say that our, our shop actually uh, commissioned to help write a report arguing for the importance of uh, a really participatory council at the federal level to help identify uh, and structure enabling policies for kind of cooperative and collaborative conservation to help achieve these goals. Cool. We'll get to more of that in a second. I, I wanted to touch on a, an issue that's sort of, in a way, existential for how these how these sorts of bold visions become reality on the ground. And when we touched base last week to kind of prep for this call, I heard this dynamic tension in the conversation between the top-down direction needed to execute a bold vision like this and the need for collaboration and local bottom-up engagement. And I'm wondering if, if Zach, you and, and Madeline could both speak to that dynamic tension because I don't think you get anywhere without embracing that tension. And if you want to go first, Maddie, and then you, Zach. Sure. It, you know, I've thought a lot about this because the landscape I work in, the greater Gila is you know, has very conservative political leanings. There are progressive strongholds and a great activist and, and committed conservation community there. But it's, you know, I've had really frank and honest conversations with people who deeply believe in like UN black helicopters and the rural cleansing agenda. And so I've, I think a lot about like, how do you talk to someone who's how do you meet someone like that where they are? How do you talk to them about this? And it, for me, it started with saying, so what's your vision for you and your community over the next decade? And they might say, you know, we're going to cut down the whole forest so it can't burn and there's no more spotted owls. Or they might say, we really need jobs and we really need a way to keep young people around. And that's a common thing we can talk about. And that's a way to say, well, maybe there's a way conservation and a big conservation goal can fit into your vision too. And we can start to create some shared values to have a conversation with. Um, and, and then at the same time, I, you know, working at the grass tops level, there's a lot of pushing to be done around like what biodiversity conservation actually means. You know, John has a great story of like hearing a wolf pack where both pack in the Gila wilderness, where both pack members were missing a leg because it had been amputated because they've been caught in a trap. And if we have wilderness areas where you can go in and kill predators because there's ongoing livestock grazing in that wilderness area, is that really protected for biodiversity conservation? So I, you know, it's, it's, I love the, the tension. I'm all about the tension. And I think it's being really intentional in what spaces you bring up, what aspects of the conservation, because I'm never going to say to someone in Katrin County, wilderness doesn't go far enough. Or I'm not going to say to a really conservative person down there, wilderness doesn't go far enough. Um, but I'm definitely going to say that to the larger conservation community and really push us to think about what it means. Uh, but I think really asking questions that enroll people and get them out of a fear-based place um, where I think a lot of people, regardless of how they interact with conservation are in right now. Zach, your thoughts on, on holding, not resolving this dynamic tension between top down and bottom up? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really tricky and it's it's kind of, uh, it's really clear too with, with kind of both the broad scope and goals of the 30 by 30 initiative, as well as its really strong emphasis on kind of collaboration and inclusion, environmental justice and equity. 
Um, and I think there is a real dynamic tension there because if you're going to try to achieve something really big and large and, and substantive on the ground, um, you know, I think I've seen I've seen some a lot of folks in the conservation community going, oh, you know, we could just do a big rulemaking, you know, like road lists, except for maybe climate, you know, carbon uh, strongholds and you know key places for biodiversity. Um, and of course, that you know, if you look at the road list rule, it was not participatory at all, right? Uh, the states weren't even allowed to contribute. And uh, and while that was also a wonderful conservation achievement, you know, um, it was also pretty clear cut and they did it in two years because they'd already mapped out where all these key areas are. Um, so moving forward, I, th I think it's it's going to be important to think about, you know, what are going to be those systems that can allow uh, local communities to help define their vision for what this means and operationalize it using the policy tools that are available. Well, I look forward to both participating in and watching that dynamic play out all across the, the political and, and geopolitical landscape. I want to stay high level. I, I, every time I put these conversations together, I have too many questions. But I do want to get to some of these, even if I, we don't have a whole lot of time, because we could spend a dinner party talking about this next question and not fully explore it. But it's, it's a high level question and it relates to a question I wanna get from the audience in a, in a moment. So Interior Department seems to be designated as the lead on implementing this vision. The US Department of Agriculture, in addition to all these other federal agencies is gonna play a prominent role as well. Which of these two agencies is, is better suited to lead this initiative and why? I mean, I, I just think it's a fascinating question and. Why don't you take it, Maddie? Try to be brief. Then you, Zach, and if you want to get in, Ethan, you as well. And then we'll go, go to the audience with a question. I want to have the impassioned uh, dinner party debate some other time. Uh, I'm team Department of Agriculture because I really believe that we are where we are, um, where we are currently in terms of having a dialogue around the impacts of industrialized agriculture is where we were in the 90s in reference to fossil fuels. We're just at the beginning of a massive 10 or 15 years of work to fundamentally transform the industry and the role it plays in communities and in our lives. And a lot of the impacts I deal with in my work are a result of how we choose to raise animals for human consumption in this country. And I think, you know, when I'm looking at the future and what challenges we're gonna see in the next decade, like coal is one, oil and gas, you know, we've got a nail or two left in that coffin. And we're just now getting to the place like where we're ready to talk about animal agriculture. Although there was a whole kerfuffle that involved the White House and a hamburger. So we're clearly not even in a place where we're gonna have a rational conversation. So for that reason, I'm team agriculture because I think the conversation needs to be, that's the conversation we need to be having, um, even if they're a little culturally hamstrung. Zach, and then Ethan, if you want to get in. I would just second what Madeline said. I mean, I think if you're looking at where the 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 real conservation, substantive conservation gains are going to be, it, you know, it's going to be on private land and a lot of it probably going to be coming through kind of things like farm bill incentives and programs, ideally. I think that's where the big gains are. So I'm just going to second, second my own there. Anything to add, Ethan? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll agree with um, Malin and, and Zach can say that um, I think it's agriculture, but also also private land, um, particularly as we start thinking about how do we restore these low elevation ecosystems that have been used really intensively over the past century or two in order to, to maintain species richness and, and all these other values. Yeah. All three percent from myself, which is to say, I think, you know, it's, I don't want to speak on behalf of tribes or indigenous people and how they view 30 by 30, but I think one of the more compelling arguments for the Department of the Interior is it is where the trust responsibility for the tribe sits and where a lot of that government to government interaction sits. And it's, you know, learning from indigenous land practices, um, talking about how we're going to account trust lands and reservations. Um, and engaging the tribes in, you know, their needs around biodiversity and climate change also feels uh, really central to this. That would be my like, you know, 
interior on this shoulder, agriculture on this shoulder conversation. Well, you, you sort of preempted me. I wasn't gonna say that exact point, but I just feel like given that the, there's a 3-0 block on this, we need a dissenting opinion. And I just feel like Interior's political leadership is so much more well positioned to provide you know, the vision and the political chops to get it done, even as I agree with the points about, you know, all of the tentacles that USDA has and how that reaches into rural communities in ways that positions USDA as well. So I wanna follow that with a question from the audience. This one is from Terry Forrester and I throw questions to whoever wants to grab them, so. How is your organization, so maybe this is for you, Maddie, but it could be for you too, Zach, addressing the destruction caused by animal agriculture. I never see this squarely socked, socked in the jaw by environmental groups, maybe too politically sensitive, she says. Do you have a definitive stance on this? And she says, vegan here. So thank you for your question, Terry. Sure, I'll take an initial stab. I think what I'll say is, you know, Animal agriculture is not a monolith, and it's um, it's sort of like the misnomer of we're going to act on climate change as if there is like one singular action we're going to take that is going to solve climate change. Addressing the environmental and like uh, human rights impacts of industrialized animal agriculture is a multifaceted, multi-pronged decades long campaign, some of which is work that Guardians Guardians does and is well positioned to do and some of it is not. And so a lot of our work is addressing the public lands impacts of the industrial animal agricultural industry. And we do that through my work on grazing permit retirement, which works to permanently retire lands from grazing as well as our and the war on wildlife and coexistence campaigns that work to reform the federal agencies that use lethal predator control at the uh, request of the animal agricultural industry and then working to sort of shift money away from lethal control and destructive practices and towards incentivizing agriculture that's focused on coexistence and when you get a cow bear or cow wolf conflict you're always having the native wildlife win um and you know i'll point to the sort of hamburger meat out day thing that's been happening this spring i think people are hungry for that conversation um, and the largest company in Colorado is JBS, um, which is owned by a Brazilian mafia member, essentially, and uh, is a animal, is a livestock company, a uh, meatpacking company. And so they're really, really big entities we're going up against. It's not just the conservative rancher from down the road. It are, they're the largest companies in the world. Like Amazon owns Whole Foods now. So it's a big fight. And I, you know, I say that just to give context of it's, it's not clear what all the right paths forward are. And so Guardians is doing what we can do with the tools we have, and we know we're having an effect, but like by no means is getting permit retirement done in New Mexico going to end animal agriculture in the U.S. Anything to add, either one of you? If not, that's fine. We can move on. We got another Got another question from the audience that I'd like to ask now. All right, I'll, I'll go to that. Um, so this one is from Justin Sirachi. Would love to hear the panelists thoughts on what should qualify as protected conserved under 30 by 30. For instance, how about conservation focused easements on working agricultural lands? As noted, private lands will need to play a substantial role in getting to 30% but obviously there are ecosystem function services that some working landscapes won't provide if kept in agriculture. Why don't you go Zach and then Ethan and um, maybe you Maddie, if we've got time. Yeah, I would, you know, I'd, I'd say absolutely. If you're, if, you know, obviously it depends. It's kind of a context specific one, you know. Um, you know, some agricultural easements are really just focused on the open space aspect where maybe you're still doing maybe not the best agricultural practices. Um, I think really great ones uh, in the conservation easement sphere are, you know, a lot of ones that are just, uh, um, associated with kind of working forest land, sustainable forest management. Um, and there's actually a lot of great federal programs that kind of support those. Um, I'd say that things like that should be considered. 
Um, but, you know, it can get kind of tricky too. other things where if you're looking at 30 year leases under the Conservation Reserve Program, which basically government kind of leases from private agricultural uh, uh, producers to basically maintain cover crops or maintain native grassland. No, those aren't totally permanent since they're 30 years. You know, would that qualify? And I kind of hope so. Um, so in, in short, yes, but I think it can it could probably be complicated. Anything to add, Ethan, briefly? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be too negative on that because I think it's a really important point. And I um, I certainly think conservation easements on agricultural lands are, are, are a huge good. Um, I would say that from the scientific perspective, the the 30 30 percent of, of terrestrial ecoregions does not include agricultural land. That is basically land with land that's that's set aside with a minimum level of of human disturbance. There's a, a, a second provision in the Diner's Land paper which sort of says that like in addition to this kind of these kind of like core protected areas, we have kind of I, I forget the term, but it's like climate reserves or something. Something where you're trying to keep basically um, representative ground cover, you're, you're not leading to um, whole scale landscape transformation, but maybe there is something where like, um, where kind of like a, a shade grown coffee might, might play a role where, it, you know, it's providing some carbon sequestration services, it's protecting biodiversity, even though it's not going to do these things as effectively um, as, as, yeah, like primary rainforest would. Now, I think what maybe a, a slightly more positive spin on that is that I think it's really context dependent. So for instance, where I, where I grew up in Vermont, um, we're, we're currently seeing basically a, a loss of these kind of secondary um, post-agricultural successional habitats um, that are, are, are returning to secondary or, or tertiary forest. And this is actually causing a loss in local species richness because there's some, some bird species, a lot of plant species that are really, um, really require gaps. Um, and, and without sort of a, a disturbance force in the landscape, um, the way that, you know, here in New Mexico we have with fire, uh, you're going to see some biodiversity loss. So I think that's where it, it kind of comes down to a a conversation with with scientists and managers and communities about how how we integrate these these different priorities and, and maybe that's the best place for for conservation easements on on working land and kind of these similar um, sort of non fortress style models of conservation. Yeah, lots of challenges to be to be grappling with to to marry the 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 urgency and the scientific and political dimensions to this, this vision. Um, we're gonna get to more questions from the audience. I'd like to shift to um, the Gila, the greater Gila. Uh, it's a place that's near and dear to many guardians' hearts. Uh, it's the birthplace of wilderness. It's a still wild landscape with lots of unprotected uh, wild lands. How does a place like the greater Gila fit into the 30 by 30 vision? and I'm curious, Madeline, if you could speak to this, uh, take the floor. Um, you know, we've included in the conversation here, why? What's the argument for the greater Gila's relevance to the 30 by 30 co conversation nationally? Sure, so I'll go three places. First is gonna be science. Second is sort of gonna be opportunity. And third is gonna be sort of conservation legacy. So if you look at the map that's associated with the ecoregions paper, the New Mexico, Arizona mountain ecoregion is its own distinct ecoregion. It is biologically different from the areas around it. Uh, it stands out as an island when you're looking in North America and it's a species richness hotspot. Um, we always love to say the Gila National Forest has uh, more species present and is more biodiverse than Yellowstone National Park. So just from a purely quantitative um, analysis of where are there ecoregions where we can protect significant chunks of where you have significant opportunity, which is my pivot to my second point, like the Gila is a bright spot on the map of like, yes, we should be protecting that because it's unique and it has a ton of species in it. And 
it has a lot of consolidated federal ownership, which is not to say that is an easy lift. And it's not to say that there is not state and private land that would come into play. But compared to places like talking about prairie ecosystems where you're dealing with majority private land, it's a much easier lift to create sort of a cohesive protection vision that is aimed at sustaining uh, the biodiversity of the region. Um, and then third, there's, you know, the, the greater Gila is where Aldo Leopold, who is, you know, important and flawed, uh, convinced the Forest Service almost 100 years ago to shift its model from sort of only focusing on producing board feed and AUMs to at least having a few models of forest reserves, which are what eventually became wilderness areas. And so there's a deep agency legacy as well as conservation community legacy in this landscape to say like what's the next move like not let's just add acres for acres sake but let's really sit down and say here's an ecosystem that we know we need to protect because the science is giving us the information that says this should be protected we've pretty consolidated ownership and so what's the play what can we put together that actually is going to protect it from the modern threats there's you know airspace threats for militarized jets. Uh, there's copper mining threats. There's, um, you know, water development project threats on all of these sort of very small and delicate desert rivers. Uh, and there's a huge threat from livestock grazing. And so what what is a designation or a patchwork of designations or management frameworks? I'm going to forget Zach's um, acronym, OECMs, OCEMs. Um, that, that brings this reality to fruition. And then how do you go sell it to a county that's tried to secede from the country three times? Um, <laughs> so that's, uh, but for me, that's the why around the Gila. It's sort of, you know, bright spot on a map, a lot of opportunity um, and really a legacy of asking big, hard questions and driving cultural change in the institutions that guide us. I have another question for Madeline before I, I ask it, it's Gila specific. Do either of you two, uh, Zach or, or Ethan, just want to offer your perspective on why a place like the Greater Gila is especially relevant or uniquely relevant to the 30 by 30 conversation? I'm personally less familiar with the Greater Gila, um, but I think that it's critical because it's, it's basically if we were thinking about this from kind of like a social science lens where the, act, the real action on the ground is gonna be collaborative and it's gonna be around identifiable landscapes where there is kind of uh, you know, a socially defined landscape, a community um, existing organization around key goals for it. And so um, I think it would be, it's probably an exemplary place where this kind of thing can occur because that, you have that in place. Cool. Anything to add, Ethan, briefly? Yeah, I would just jump in and say, um, you know, from my perspective, it obviously has these incredibly high biodiversity values. It's a, a largely intact landscape. There's lots of space. Um, so, you know, it's a conservation biologist dream in that sense. But, but particularly as we um, stare down the, the barrel of climate change, it's at this kind of critical juncture where it, you know, it is just a, a few stones throws away from the Sierra Madre through the Madre and Sky Islands and also quite close to the southern tip of the Rockies. Um, so it, it, it's going to provide this important corridor for species that are able to move north to track their climatic envelope, so to speak. Um, and, and in some ways, I think we're already starting to see kind of the, the initial forays of this. Something I got really excited about last year was um, two eared quetzals, which are uh, usually really hard to see in the Sierra Madre of Mexico and, and, and only rarely come into the US, usually in Arizona, um, were, were found in the Gila for the first time north of Silver City. So I, I think it's going to be a place that sees a lot of change, but is also likely to retain all of these kind of special characteristics that uh, Madeline spoke so eloquently about. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to both of you for adding to, to Madeline's perspective. So one more question to you, Maddie. Um, you spoke to this, the sort of black hel helicopter UN conspiracy theories. Um, given where 30 by 30 is relatively early in terms of its prominence on the national political map, 
what are the challenges and the opportunities of a place like the greater Gila? And, and really my, in terms of advancing 30 by 30 with rural counties and communities. And just a related question is how can we ensure that the vision and the policy don't get ensnared in that, that dynamic, that narrative, or, you know, is this gonna happen and should we just not worry about that? To a certain extent, it's the latter. I think what is the biggest challenge I've encountered doing the work is what the national GOP decides to do and how they decide to weaponize messaging um, and how that's portrayed through conservative media. Because we could do the best work in the world. And if you have, you know, the party leadership talking about how 30 by 30 is Democrats trying to do rural cleansing, like there's, you know, I like to think I could take on Mitch McConnell, but he's got fighting with a lot more firepower than I am. Um, and so there's a certain element that's like, there's there's going to be opposition. It's going to get called a land grab. And we're rather than trying to prevent that from happening and tiptoe around it, I think it's wading into that conversation and saying, tell me why you think it's a land grab. What are you actively losing? What have you lost since Biden came into office? Not in a threatening way, but, but really saying like, okay, what has actually changed on the ground for you? And what would you like to have change on the ground? And is this, this maybe an opportunity to drive some change that you would like to see? Um, and it, it's hard. And I think it's, a, it's really moving at like the speed of trust and building as many relationships as possible. So when there is fear around the issue, uh, there are trusted people in the community who can say, you know, I'll be transparent about what's gonna happen. There is this big proposal on the table and it is gonna change things, And but maybe it could help you and maybe it could get you more money for your school or it will create more jobs and what do you need out of it? And you're not gonna win everybody and their old organizing adage is you just need 3% to sway public opinion. So then it's, you know, going to our political leadership and saying, you know, is 2.8 in this really red county gonna be good enough for you? Um, but I, you know, I try to be transparent and kind of open-hearted about it. Like, I love having the hard conversations. I love it when people come to me and are afraid and angry and I can sort of be like, well, let's talk about that for four hours. And I don't convince them of everything, but I usually get invited back. Yeah, I, it feels like a, an opportune moment to resurface the dynamic tension. I love the phrase and I believe in it, working at the speed of trust. And is that sufficient to address the speed of the biodiversity crisis, the extinction crisis, and the climate crisis. And that's, that's this fundamental dilemma we have. I want to get to audience questions. But before I do, I've wanted to ask each of you, Zach and, and Ethan, a question. So if you could be brief, so then we can get to three or four questions from the audience. These are big questions. So um, <clears throat> early on, Zach, you mentioned your hope that, that federal leaders uh, focus on systems and processes. And actually this, you mentioned this last week, but you alluded to it early on and not necessarily designations and acres and maps. And you mentioned the report, the Center for Large Landscape uh, Conservation produced. Um, explain a little bit more about why systems and processes and not to be sort of exclusively or overly or even at this stage at all focused on designations, acres and maps. Yeah, there's, and I, I think one is that if, if just from a rhetorical perspective, if we're focusing on this designation that says you can't do something here, and then that means it's conserved, just that kind of messaging is going to run into political blowback. Um, and I think this is what we're seeing too, even from folks in the interior is this broad definition of conservation, which includes restoration, which includes all these other things, which is really important. Um, so that's kind of my first thing is like, I think, there's a strong message here to, to say too that we can talk about designations, but let's talk more about the process of how we define what conserved is at, at higher levels as well as at local scales and what that means. Um, and I think too on focusing on kind of restoration and some of these management things that we need to do to preserve ecosystem function. Um, you know, when I hear the word restoration, I mean jobs. And I think there's a lot of indication that there's gonna be a big markup in the president's budget too for civilian uh, climate conservation core and things like that. So that's the first piece. But I think the second piece regarding systems and processes is, is if you're thinking about, maybe it's NRCS, maybe it's the BLM, 
their ability to actually support these initiatives with processes in a collaborative manner is going to require new structures and processes and agencies. If you look at the BLM, if you look at the Forest Service, NRCS, they're all understaffed. They don't even have capacity to do effective outreach with local stakeholders right now at all. They don't have the capacity to engage in collaborative efforts. There are some good examples. Uh, BLM's kind of rejoined the uh, California Biodiversity Council. Um, so there's examples of these things, but it's going to require investment in the agencies. And if you are talking, uh, you know, about kind of additional designations, I mean, is it going to be rulemaking? Is it going to be planning? The BLM's been gutted. Forest Service is takes some eight, eight, I think on average seven years to get a forest plan done. You know, uh, they don't have the capacity to engage in these kind of planning processes that might be associated with designations or even large scale restoration actions. So I think from a from an advocacy perspective, too, I think it's important to push for this to to recognize rhetorically that it's not just about designations, but also to push for kind of new positions, new structures and processes. And agencies. On the tribal side, we've got very encouraging. We've got high level uh, new tribal liaisons. There's going to be a new commitment to that, which is great because it's been completely non-existent. There's been no capacity to engage with tribes. And so on the federal line, you're going to need, you know, dedicated liaisons, not just the national level, but all the way down and through, right? Um, but you're also going to need to support the tribes. Um, and so, you know, it's for in some cases, and this gets to an equity issue, we might need to think about having grants. So, you know, under, you know, in places where there's not collaborative capacity, because, you know, it takes a lot. If you're, if you're a working person who's, who is not, you know, a wealthy retiree, it's hard to go to collaborative meetings. So we need to even think about having funding and, and systems to support people to allow them to participate in this. Um, and so I think that's another kind of key piece for advocates to think about is, is pushing for these systems and processes and structures and enabling policies that can support these efforts on the ground. Love that. Thank you, um, Zach. Um, Ethan, I got a big question that I want you to try to be brief in, in answering, which is, you know, you're here as a conservation biologist, ecologist, you've got a deeply vested interest in, in 30 by 30 success. Um, clearly looking at this Dinnerstein paper, the global deal for nature and lots of good science already happening. What's, what's your take on what needs to continue to happen uh, within the scientific community to drive support for 30 by 30 through the lens of supporting the policy and the advocacy? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be really dependent on, on, on what people's roles are as scientists, what their relationship to policy already is. You know, I'm sort of in, in, in ivory tower, but there are a lot of people who are more directly interfacing with, um, with agencies already. Um, I think the most impactful thing that scientists can do um, in, in support of these goals is, is sort of clean up their own house. I think we're uh, facing a, a crisis as the university system starts to bottom out where we're, we're training too many people, we don't have jobs for them, and we're losing a lot of talent. And I think that one of the things I would like to see the scientific community grapple with as we move towards these big goals, whether that's climate science or biodiversity conservation, is, is how we can um, create a more, a more healthy and equitable ecosystem of of employment where you can get scientists working on the little granular questions that are going to come up as we try to implement 30 by 30, even though we have this kind of like broader understanding of what it's gonna take. Yeah, that's great. All right, let's get to some audience questions. Um, this one is from Brian Gibbons. He says, with continued population loss in rural America across the nation, though not necessarily less land use because of big ag, oil, and other extraction, can 30 by 30 reclaim these areas? Also, can a reclamation be too small or patchwork uh, to be effective? So two questions there. The first one, a huge one about the loss of rural population and the other about size. I'll, I'll be quick on the first yeah. one. That, that question is actually sort of at the core of how Zach, Ethan, and I initially connected, which is I was interested in having this conversation about uh, the affordability crisis and housing stock crisis in the American West and conservation and sort of the billionaire wilderness phenomenon, which is what's happened in Jackson Hole in Teton County, Wyoming, where so much of the private land is now under conservation easements 
on these large private estates, uh, they there's just physically not enough space to build the housing to support a community there. And, and that's obviously like a hyper-polarized example of what can happen. Um, but I raise that just to say, like, I think this is a great question. I think there's obvious examples of Teton County, of Bozeman, Montana, of Santa Fe, New Mexico, where people in the past year have decamped from the coasts into smaller communities. And it's a question of, um, you know, I have a good friend who runs the Office of Outdoor Recreation for New Mexico. And she always says, Maddie, how do we get people to move to grants? And if you've been to grants, the two economic drivers and grants were a women's prison and a coal mine, and there's definitely not any Thai food. And so there's this chicken and egg question around there's beautiful wildlands there, interesting cultural landscape, and not a lot of the other amenities that people want. Um, so I think there's really interesting like private sector philanthropic funding opportunities to fund business owners to go into these communities. But you know, mostly I'd say that's a great question and I'm thinking about it too. Either you wanna jump in. I got another question for, this one's for Zach, but anyone wanna jump in briefly? All right, this one's from Ben Goldfarb. I believe this is Ben Goldfarb, the beaver guy. Good to have you, Ben. Also the road ecology guy, seeing this. The road one. ecology, okay. How do we make sure that 30 by 30 is promoting connectivity? And you can touch on this too, Ethan. Uh, not creating isolated protected areas. Thoughts on the relationship between 30 by 30 and the alleviation on barriers to wildlife movement, thinking of roads in particular. Ben, I'm so glad you asked this question, actually. Um, so, and again, this is kind of my organizational and interest biased, uh, but I think connectivity is a really important framing for 30 by 30 because ecosystems aren't jur jurisdictional boxes, right? Um, and I think thinking about habitat connectivity for all kinds of species is a good way to help people think about this larger ecosystem perspective and this larger landscape. So I really think it's, a, it's kind of an important framing or could be an important framing element for really achieving uh, large scale ecosystem goals through 30 by 30. Um, if you're doing that, right, I think there's, it also forces you, if you're looking across jurisdictional boundaries, it also necessitates a, a look across sectors, including transportation. We've already mentioned agriculture. Right. And I think this is a really important thing to also be rolling this in is that if we're really going to be conserving ecosystem function and these functional aspects, uh, then we need to consider all these other different sectors like transportation and roads and rails and transmission lines that could be influencing this functional connectivity. Now, to do that, um, I think this is really where you start getting into kind of maybe some wonky policy tools at different levels. Um, at the federal level, I think the greatest opportunity for, for doing this is potentially through the new transportation plan. And actually some folks in our shop helped write in uh, the $500 million, I think it's up to now, that could be allocated to wildlife crossings. Um, however, if you're gonna be doing this, right, how do you get these different agencies to work together? And I think there's a lot of really interesting tools. Um, so it could be things from, you know, programmatic environmental, I'm, actually I won't go into the need, but uh, it could be things like more liaison positions in federal land management agencies. There's a couple of these right now where you got Federal highways pass through money that goes through a state transportation department that basically pays for a guy who's housed in the Forest Service, right? And what that does is it helps transportation department get these things on their agenda before these big projects start happening. Um, so kind of in short, I think like one, there's this like kind of like strategic framing element that's saying this is what this, this should be a big part of it. And then there's kind of a lot of different substantive policy tools for making sure that it's integrated at agency and project levels. Um, and Ben, if you wanna hear a whole list of those, I could be happy to talk through you at some point. I'm gonna take one more question. Before I do, is there any follow-up from, from either you or um, you, Ethan, or Madeline on, on this question? Very brief point, which is just that I think connectivity is somewhere that restoration is gonna be especially important and is somewhere where I think some of the potential components of a Green New Deal could be really effective. How do we restore landscapes, get people jobs in the interest of connectivity? I'm gonna try and say a sentence that ties together this big thought I'm having, which is there's a tendency when you hear protect 30% to go designation. And I there's been a lot of energy in this conversation around 
the word tools and really thinking about how can we create a suite of tools that are implemented across the landscape and then account for their impact and have 30 by 30 mean that rather than lines on a map. Um, and I think that's, that's gonna be the art of getting this done is we need like a civilian monitoring core to go with the everything else. All right, adding to the complexity. I know we're at time, but I wanna ask one more question from the audience and then we can close. It's, I'm gonna merge these questions. They're from Doyle McClure and Bob Leggett and they're basically political in nature. They're both, I'll read them both. Nice to hear about these wonderful high level visions, but with 2022 thin ice coming to Congress, what is Guardians? What are we doing broadly? Conservation community to cross that bridge. And then relatedly, how vulnerable is 30 by 30 to congressional balances? What might happen in the 2022 elections to limit 30 by 30? Thoughts on that? Briefly, we can't, you know, this is me being 29 and having the political views that I do, which is like, we, we got to get out of this, like, we just won a massive election. And yeah, the margin got narrower in the House, but what we overwhelmingly heard from the American people is they support the bold platform that Biden ran on and the bold platform that he's implementing. And the best thing we can do to shore up 30 by 30 in 2022 is go big and go big now and deliver the policy outcomes that Biden ran on for the American people. That's like, there's just my whole life been so much of like, we can't do this because we don't want to lose the next election. And we've got to switch that to we must do this because we can't lose the next election. Though you're 29, Maddie, spoken like a true guardian. Love that. Zach or Ethan, a closing thought on this or anything else, actually? Yeah, I mean, I, I think politically, just for my mind, I think there, frankly, there is a risk if this keeps getting, you know, because it, it's still so loose and vague, there's still a danger, and this is kind of my closing thought too, there's still a danger for it being defined by the other side as this land grab, because, because it is vague, you know, even interior, like there's not a lot of clarity on what this means right now. Um, and I can see that drawing some political backlash, to be honest, if whether, you know, if we have a complete changeover in Congress, I think the administration and agencies are still going to be doing this, might affect kind of budgetary allocation for maybe some new 30 by 30 budget lines, frankly. Um, but again, I think that's that's just thinking about the political thing. I think that is why it's really important for you guys and everybody on here who is an advocate and who is trying to communicate what this is to folks um, to really make sure it is kind of this broader, expansive uh, effort um, and not just about, you know, saying what people can't do in certain areas. Ethan, comment on this and, and a closing thought. Yeah, I mean, really briefly, I think like, as we've talked about, there are a ton of challenges, a lot of pitfalls. I think there's also a chance to do real harm if we don't think this through well. But I guess I would finish with the, the idea that there is a, a, a real moral good here. There is a, you know, something that's, that's really valuable um, to fight for, and, and that should be really motivating. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you, Zach and Madeline. Great to have this conversation. Just a few closing thoughts for me. Um, I was reading half, a little bit of Half Earth last night, and I was just reminded about both the moral and aesthetic arguments. You know, E.O. Wilson is so eloquent, and I just encourage all of the people here on this call webinar to, I imagine that each of you have a story from your childhood or youth about why the natural world inspires you. And it is that sense of awe and wonder and beauty that is an incredible source of inspiration and energy. And I just, uh, again, reading E.O. Wilson reminded how important both the moral and ethical imperatives and the aesthetic imperatives to this work are. So, um, and relatedly, uh, I forgot to call on all of you just to, we've got an action alert in the chat box just to urge Congress to do its part to support 30 by 30. So each of you can do that. If you can't do it now, hit our website after this. And then um, finally, I, what I love about 30 by 30 
is that I think it really presents opportunities not only to address these two existential crises, but really to reinvigorate, um, reinvigorate civic engagement and communities. And it, it's where I find this notion intriguing about building the systems and the processes and the collaborative groups on the front line to really help implement the vision. So it's that that leaves me inspired, this, this hoped for um, rural engagement and conservation community engagement to really be able to ex uh, address the complexity uh, of this problem. So, cause we're not gonna be able to do it uh, as you noted, Zach, with a roadless rule. It's just the scale of this problem is far greater than any, any simple um, significant solution like that. So again, thank you to the three of you. Thank you to the audience for the lively questions as well. And maybe we'll do it again in, in six months. So I appreciate it. I hope you all have a good evening and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It was fun. Well, that's fun. Madeline, I get, you got to let me pick your brain about grazing policy. I've been falling behind on it at some point. Oh, yeah. Not I'm now, happy. obviously, but some point. Maybe yeah. a happy hour thing. Yeah, let's do it. Shoot me an email. Cool. Um, you too, Ethan. You're fun. I, I kind of want to gotta get it. Um, Jesse, although he's in Europe, so it's going to be a nightmare to involve him and then actually get Millie and Justin. It's like inspiring me. <laughs> Poor. Matador, Terry. Cool. This is fun, guys. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. I think I'm going to jump off now, but. Um, me too. See, see you guys. Later. Bye.